Manette, um, or Mimi Drumright, is an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the Stan Richards School of Advertising and Public Relations in the Moody College of Communication and in the Business, Government, and Society Department in the McComb School of Business. Before joining U the UT faculty, she was on the marketing faculties of Harvard Business School and the Hankamer School of Business at Baylor University. She received her PhD in Business Administration from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She has both a BA and an MBA from Baylor University. Uh, she was an English major with a concentration in journalism while she was here at Baylor. Her research and teaching are in the areas of ethics, leadership, corporate social responsibility, and communication for nonprofit organizations. She currently teaches a liberal arts honors course called Leadership and Ethics, and a course required of all advertising and public relations majors titled Advertising and Public Relations Law and Ethics. She teaches courses in integrated communication for nonprofit organizations at both the graduate and undergraduate levels. Drumright has led a number of initiatives related to leadership and ethics on the UT uh, Austin campus, which she will be talking about today. Since 2002, she has been uh, the chair or co-chair of Bridging Disciplines Program in Leadership and Ethics. She was chair of the Ethics and Leadership Flag Committee from 2012 to 2015, and during that period, the number of seats in leadership and uh, ethics and leadership flag courses increased from under 10,000 to more than 20,000. She chaired an initiative to create an undergraduate degree in leadership, which culminated in the new communication and leadership degree approved by the UT system in August of 2016. She is a member of the Ethics and Health Working Group that is planning for a Center for Medical Ethics in conjunction with the UT Austin's new Dell Medical Center. She is a member of the advisory board for Ethics Unwrapped, an initiative to create ethics films sponsored by the McComb School of Business. She is also a faculty fellow of the RGK Center for Philanthropy and Community Service at the LBJ School for Public Policy. She is a recipient of the 2016 Kale McGow Award for Innovation and Undergraduate Studies and has received various other teaching awards over the years. Before entering graduate school, she worked in advertising for several years and then served as public relations director for the Baylor Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, the Baptist Medical Center in Jackson, Florida, and the Hankamer School of Business at Baylor University. Her husband, H.W. Perry, is a government and law professor at UT Austin who just happens to be giving a talk in the Baylor Political Science Department this afternoon. Their daughter, Lauren, received a BA in sociology with high honors from Harvard University in 2014, and she just completed two years with Teach for America and is currently working for GSDNM, an advertising agency in Austin. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Drumright. Thank you, Marlene, and thank you to all of you for being here on a Friday afternoon, and I apologize for changing the time. I had to go to the funeral of my uncle, Ralph Pulley, this morning, and that's why we pushed the session later. And uh, I skipped the graveside service, and I think the only excused absence in my family for missing something like that would be to come and talk at Baylor, because I'm a fourth generation Baylorite, and uh, the family uh, talks about um, how disloyal I am for teaching at the University of Texas, but we got two jobs there, my husband and I, and you just think of us as missionaries to the Longhorns, okay? Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it, it's a lot of fun for me. And I wanted to tell you that when I go to a reception or a dinner party and people say, what do you do? I typically say, well, I teach and research about business ethics. And about 80% of the time, I get the same response. And it goes something like this. Business ethics, isn't that an oxymoron? And then the person laughs as if she's the first person to have ever said that and starts telling me that you really can't teach ethics because um, if people didn't learn the difference in right and wrong when they were in elementary school, they're just not going to get it. And I'll have more to say about that in a minute. Um, but it is challenging, I think, to, uh, to teach ethics in business and professional programs. And in fact, there is some research that shows that business and professional education often renders people less likely to act ethically. Not that the professors intend to communicate that, but unless ethics is directly addressed often, the message that students typically take away is you do whatever it takes to win. You do whatever it takes to succeed. 
So I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the challenges of teaching ethics in professional schools. Now, I think those of you who are from church-related institutions have it a lot easier than those of us who are at public un universities or at uh, private non-church universities. I've spent most of my career at, at Harvard and the University of Texas, so that kind of informs uh, my experience and thinking. So the resistance to teaching ethics comes oftentimes from professors. And here's what the kinds of things they say. Um, you can't teach ethics to adults, even young adults. And that really is particularly puzzling to me because that asserts that, that adults can't learn. And who of us hasn't had a course that really changed our thinking and helped us learn some new insights? And so uh, suggesting that, learn, that adults can't change their perspectives, I think, is really against everything higher education is about. Oftentimes, professors, business and professional school professors, feel unprepared to teach ethics. They didn't study philosophy, they don't understand it, and uh, don't feel comfortable with it. And then oftentimes, prof professors say, we don't have the curriculum materials to teach ethics. We don't have the kinds of, of great cases and videos, films to use in teaching ethics. They say, we don't have the time to teach ethics. We've got so much to convey to make our students into the kinds of specialists that they need to be, that we just don't have time in our courses to teach ethics. And then business and professional school professors often say, you know, whose values should be taught in a diverse global context? And they worry that they just be teaching their own values, which would be kind of akin to uh, teaching, teaching people to have their same political or religious values. So these are some of the uh, concerns that professors have about teaching business ethics or professional ethics. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to try to do in this talk, and I want to invite you to speak up at any point with questions. We should have plenty of time for questions and discussions at the end, but please speak up at any point. I'm first going to talk about content, and that is what can we teach competently in business and professional schools related to ethics. And then I'd like to talk about the institutional mechanisms that we have, particularly at the University of Texas, for teaching content related to leadership and ethics. So I'd like to begin by making a distinction between uh, moral dilemmas and moral temptations. And oftentimes what, what, what philosophers deal with are moral dilemmas, like how does one uh, equitably allocate a few kidney dialysis machines to many people who need them, or how do we morally justify war? Um, so these are great debates, and you philosophers and theologians are masters at these debates and theories and at the frameworks that uh, can inform them. And certainly business and professional students need to understand various approaches to moral reasoning, and one doesn't have to be a philosopher to give the basics. Um, the more complicated aspects of philosophy do need, need to be left to, philo to philosophy courses, but we can talk about the basics of something like utilitarianism without knowing the differences between Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill and Henry Sidwick. So that can be done. But what I'd like to really kind of focus on are moral temptations, which, and these are what many of the problems in business and the professions involve, and these are situations in which it's often not hard to know what the right thing to do is, but it's often really hard to do the right thing. Uh, for example, we know we shouldn't pad our timesheets and overbill our clients, or mislead our bosses to think that we've done more work than we have, or lie to consumers in ads or press releases, but it can be very tempting to do those things. And uh, the challenge is not so much with moral temptations in figuring out what the right thing to do is, but in uh, figuring out how to do the right thing. And I think uh, professors in business and professional schools are generally quite good at analyzing situations and helping people figure out how to get things done. So I want to talk today about a way of teaching ethics that particularly lends itself to the, to the expertise of professors in business and the professions and social sciences. 
and many of you have probably heard of this. It's behavioral ethics, which is the study of how people make the ethical and unethical decisions that they do. Um, and I think it's particularly helpful when one knows what the right thing to do is, but really is having trouble figuring out how to get that done. It draws on sociology and psychology and the social sciences. It's similar to uh, behavioral finance, behavioral accounting, behavioral economics, and draws its same uh, theoretical underpinnings from the same disciplines as, as uh, these particular um, areas. So the three premises of behavioral ethics are first, that people make most of their decisions instinctively or emotionally rather than rationally. This is what Daniel Kahneman calls system one, the rather emotional uh, approach to decision making. Uh, people tend to believe that they're living ethical lives while simultaneously doing a lot of things that ethical people wouldn't do. And then the third premise is that there are cognitive biases, various rationalizations, and then social and organizational pressures and situational factors that can make it difficult for even the most well-intentioned people to live as ethically as they would like. And so what I'd like to do is take just a few minutes and explain um, some of the, some ideas related to behavioral ethics. Um, and I want to begin by talking about uh, some research that I did with Patrick Murphy, a business professor, a marketing professor at Notre Dame. He and I went out and we talked to uh, a number, we, we interviewed a number of people who were very successful people in advertising about how they confront ethical issues. And as we analyzed the data, we found one theme, and that theme we called moral myopia. And moral myopia is a distortion of moral vision in which the ethical issues just don't come clearly into focus. And it may be so acute that the person is uh, basically blind to ethical issues. And this can happen at the individual level where an individual person doesn't see, isn't really aware of the unethical things that she's doing. It can happen at the organizational level in which uh, there might be policies, practices, systems that seem neutral on their face, but in reality they in incline people to make decisions that are unethical. Or it can occur at the societal level. There may be societal problems like climate change or obesity, and we just don't make the connection between what we do in our work and those problems and how we might be contrib contributing to them. So. Uh, moral myopia comes in these various forms, and we found another phenomenon that tended to reinforce moral myopia, and that's moral muteness, that people just didn't feel comfortable talking about ethical issues. And so you can see how moral myopia and moral muteness reinforce each other. Uh, you don't talk about ethical issues, so you don't see them so clearly. You don't see them, so you don't talk about them. So these are uh, two of the uh, strong themes that we found in our in our research and I think that um, even if you believe that you really can't teach adults ethics I think you'll probably be willing to recognize that we can raise moral awareness and so one of the, the questions how do you raise moral awareness among business and professional students and I think that uh, one way we do it is by understanding what tends to make people have moral myopia and moral muteness. And one of the fascinating things about the research we did is that we saw patterns in the way people rationalized that supported their moral myopia and moral muteness. And these were very successful people. And so I want to tell you a little bit about, about some of these. Um, one is people who would say, well, if it's legal, it's moral or if it's not illegal, it must be ethical. Like the head of a major advertising agency who said to me, you know, this advertising is one of the most ethical businesses there is. It's so ethical because we have to send everything through our lawyers and then to the networks and their lawyers. It's really hard to be unethical in this business, even if you try. And of course, what he's done is 
uh, assume that the law will be sufficient. And ethicists and legal scholars think that the law is typically the moral minimum. He's also delegating all ethical decisions to attorneys, which is kind of scary when you get right down to it. So that's one of the rationalizations, and we can make people aware of these kinds of things. Another is what we called going native. Those of you who've had anthropology will recognize this term. It's the term anthropologists use when uh, someone goes in to study another culture and becomes so immersed in that culture that she loses the ability to think critically about it. She's gone native. Well, that can happen in work organizations, in churches, in student organizations. And here's what one person in an advertising agency can't, said. She said, you know, this bottle of shampoo has become my life. I've focused on it for more than a year. So when I saw the research results and saw that the research results were not as good as what we were claiming in the ads, it just didn't seem like anything was wrong. That had become my life. It had been my, my life for a year. So she just didn't see the ethical issue because she'd been so immersed in the client's goals. Another, the ostrich syndrome. Someone said to us, it would bother me to work for this client if I thought about it, if I really thought about it, so I just don't think about it. And we know that sticking your head in the sand is never a solution. Another rationalization, there are all kinds of goals that can compete with ethics. One of those is the client is always right. So this is a goal that seems virtuous on its face and can trump ethical concerns. As one person said, you just wouldn't want to say no to a client. That would be like shooting yourself in the foot. So you can see how a pleaseaholic syndrome develops and you've got to please the client. And when you get right down and analyze those kind of situations often, you see that that's a very superficial approach to thinking and that a trusted business advisor needs to say no to the client at some points. Another is called the First Amendment Dodge. Uh, I'll explain this one. My husband, who teaches the First Amendment, hits the roof when I talk about this. It's, here's an example. I asked the head of a major advertising agency, would you ever think about having a code of ethics in which you'd explain to your clients what you will and will not do in terms of the ethics of their ads? And he said, how could I? That would violate their First Amendment rights. Now, those of you who've had government courses know that the First Amendment is about the government restricting speech. It doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you tell your client that something's not responsible, not ethical. In fact, the the free marketplace of ideas that the First Amendment is based upon assumes that citizens and especially speech professionals will do that. But people would say, oh, First Amendment, and then kind of freeze up with respect to expressing the ethical values. Another, maximize shareholder wealth. That sounds so virtuous. We all know that that's the job of a business person. But oftentimes that can really keep one from, if you focus on that too much, it keeps you from really analyzing uh, what you're doing. And, you know, shareholders probably don't want you to pollute the streams and the air. So these kinds of goals we really need to think about carefully and critically. Ethics is bad for business. One person said, you know, if I brought up ethics to my clients or coworkers, they'd say, if you're going to talk about ethics, go run a church. We found the Pandora's box syndrome, where people uh, just wouldn't want to think about the ethical issues for fear that if they did, they'd just have to do something drastic, like uh, quit their jobs. As one person said, you know, when you start looking at it, ethical issues could just go on and on and on, and you just wouldn't know what to do. So that can be a real, um, a real problem with respect to moral awareness. And then compartmentalization. It's so easy to have one set of values for your friends and family, the way you act at your church, another set for work. As one person said, um, you know, it really bothers me to think about what thin images of women might do to uh, young women and their conceptions of beauty and their tendencies for eating disorders. So when I'm at work, I just don't think about that. Now I'd uh, like to take a time out from um, talking about these 
um, rationalizations that uh, we can teach people about and help them see so that they'll be morally aware, so they can be warned about these. Uh, uh, this probably ought to go in the second part of my, my uh, talk about mechanisms for teaching behavioral ethics, but I want to put it here because I'm going to demonstrate some of it. Ethics Unwrapped is an um, ethics curriculum initiative that is uh, sponsored by UT's Macomb School of Business. They have a film ethics initiative called Ethics Unwrapped. Robert Prentice, who is the chair of the Business, Government, and Society Department, is the faculty director, and Cara Biasucci is the film director. It is a whole set of videos, cases, teaching notes, and a film glossary on largely behavioral ethics, and it's offered free and it's used broadly uh, throughout the world. It's just several years old, but already used many places, and you can access it uh, at this website. I'll uh, demonstrate that some of these um, some of these rationalizations by using some excerpts from Ethics and Rap. So as a part of the film initiative, we took a camera person, went out and asked students on the UT campus, you know, what ethical issues have you faced? And uh, these uh, short excerpts that I'll show you are uh, excerpts of films that are um, Four to, four to eight minutes long. So thinking about goals that can compete with ethics, here's one. I had a friend who did that for money at some point, wrote essays for other people, and you know, I turned a blind eye to it, because I know the right thing would be, oh, I should turn this in to the uh, disciplinary council or the omnibus person or somebody at the university. There's that gut feeling of, I know this is wrong, but they're my friend and I don't want to do anything <laughs> to hurt that friendship. I was trying to rationalize this, this is the, the higher good, is that they are doing something to put themselves through school. Not thinking about, you know, the unethicalness of the person who's buying the paper, not actually earning their grades, or them messing up the system, or ruining the credibility of undergraduate students overall. So you can see how she initially was kind of blinded to the moral issue involved by thinking about the important goal of her friend paying her uh, to college tuition. But as she started thinking about the different stakeholders involved, including the university, other students, she started to see the issue more clearly. Uh, going native. When we ask one young man about ethical issues he faced, here's what he said. In one of the organizations I'm in here on campus, there is a very strong subculture that is not in line at all with what I feel like is the mission of our organization. I guess by the university's definition, there has been some hazing over the past couple of years. And I think that's despicable. We're open, we're about serving students, we're not about being exclusive and you know, being self-serving. It's difficult for me to speak up because these are my friends, one, and I don't want any harm to come to them. I value my relationships with these people and I don't want to affect those adversely. But it's also difficult because if the administration was to find out what we do, even if it's unofficial, um, that could lead to potentially our kicking off campus. And I definitely don't want to see that happen because that, I f that's probably worse than the strong social subculture that's emerged in recent years. So you can see how the social pressures, his friends and what they think and what would happen to the group of friends uh, keeps him from seeing the ethical issue. Moral muteness, here's what one young man said when we asked him about ethical issues. So in my theater class last semester, it was, we had these take home quizzes that we completed over Blackboard. The whole issue for me was, are you allowed to use your notes on this take-home exam when the teacher doesn't clarify whether or not she expects that you take this by yourself or not? So then that's where the rationalizations of ethics come in. Well, she knows if it's a take-home exam, then people are gonna use their notes. She has to know that. I never stood up and asked like in class, or I never stood up and emailed the professor, are we allowed to use notes on this? Because if she says yes, then it's, an, non-issue, but if she says no, then it becomes this ordeal, and I guess at the time I didn't want to be that guy. You don't want to rock the boat. If you rock the boat too much, then you don't get to be in the boat anymore. They throw you out. 
So I want to uh, illustrate compartmentalization, and to do this, I'll use a short video that is a part of a series that has a 25-minute film on Jack Abramoff. I don't know if you know his name. He was caught up, he was a very successful lobbyist who was caught up in one of the biggest lobbying scandals ever. He was uh, working with Tom DeLay, a member of Congress who also ran into great uh, ethical and legal problems. And so we've got a 25-minute film uh, on him. He's out of prison now trying to uh, reform uh, the, the lobbying system. And so we have a, a series of short films that accompany the, um, the longer film, and this is one of those. Uh, I thought I was great. I thought I was moral. I, I thought, frankly, uh, we, had a, we had an approach to our clients that we weren't going to lose. They're paying us money, and the moral thing to do is to give them what they paid for. Role morality is the tendency that people have when they're in a job to say, oh, my personal ethical standards don't apply here because I'm playing the role of a lobbyist or an engineer or a politician. My faith uh, certainly doesn't advocate uh, any of this kind of activity. Um, the Bible is very uh, severe about bribery. He himself in his book writes about the fact that there were conflicts of interest that he was part of, essentially bribing legislators to get results. And he would do that during the day. At night, he would go home and he would read the Torah and he would read about how bribery was bad and should not be done. And he did not make that connection. Um, I would look at that, by the way, the Bible speaks about bribing judges, doesn't talk about legislators. So even when it came up, I would think, well, this isn't the same thing. I'm not bribing a judge. These aren't judges. Well, the truth is, our sages in the last couple hundred years, there weren't legislators, legislatures or legislators at the time of the Bible. I think he, he had what I call a compartmentalization. He had one set of values for his friends and his family, his personal life, his religious life. He had another set for his um, work life. When he was playing the role of lobbyist, I think he let ethical matters fall out of his frame of reference altogether. That was reserved for when he was at home at night reading the Torah. In the workplace, everything was win, win, win. I've got to win for my client. I thought other lobbyists who didn't do that, who didn't care whether their clients lost, and lost or not, were the immoral lobbyists. And this is quite ironic, actually, uh, that I thought I was the moral lobbyist. So, in terms of my approach to this, uh, I didn't think anything was wrong. It's a lesson we all need to keep in mind, that if we don't look at ethical issues thoughtfully, if we're not reflective, we can make the same types of uh, terrible decisions that he made just as easily as he made them. So I hope you can see how we can, use more, we can use behavioral ethics to increase moral awareness of students in business and professional programs. But I also want to assert that we can use behavioral ethics to improve decision making. And so how can we improve decision making? I think it's very carefully intertwined with uh, raising moral awareness in that once we become aware of our vulnerabilities, like the vulnerabilities that make us morally myopic and morally mute, those kinds of, of that, that kind of awareness of those vulnerabilities can help us make better decisions, help us think more rationally. And there are all kinds of biases. I'll just name a few. The self-interest bias, where we focus so much on our self-interest that we don't see ethical issues. Or the conformity bias. Everybody's doing it. Everybody else is doing it. So we don't think about uh, making decisions in a more rational way. Um, the obedience to, th to authority bias, the, the boss asks us to do it, or a powerful client wants us to do it. These kinds of decision-making biases can keep us from being as rational as we'd like to be and as thoughtful as we'd like to be. The tangible and abstract bias, it's really easy for me to focus on what's tangible, missing my numbers, missing my bonus this quarter, and really hard for me to think about the long-term damage to um, the client or to the firm or even me in an orange jumpsuit in a prison. Those are very abstract ideas. 
So if we can understand these kinds of decision-making biases, we can make better decisions. Another is incrementalism, where people gradually make unethical decisions and get used to them, to the small ones, and then as the unethical decisions get bigger and bigger, they don't object. Whereas if they'd been asked initially to do the big unethical thing, they would have said no, but they get accustomed to the small unethical decisions. So if we can understand our vulnerabilities to these kinds of decision-making biases, I think we can make better decisions. And we can craft interventions. I bet a lot of you have heard of this study. Uh, this is a study about orchestras. For years and years, orchestras were male musicians and male directors. And uh, people who didn't think that they had any biases were picking people in orchestras for orchestras, and they all just happened to be men. So what they did was they designed a curtain, an audition curtain. So people, people would audition for an orchestra behind a curtain. And all of a sudden, many more women started being picked. And again, these were people who didn't think they had any biases, who thought they were making decisions completely on the basis of merit and um, musical talent, instrumental abilities. So, um, so we can design interventions that can help us make better decisions if we understand these, um, these behavioral ethics principles. But then perhaps the biggest question is how can we increase the likelihood that people will live in sync with their values? And so I want to talk just about a few other concepts. Uh, one of these concepts is uh, from the study that I was talking to you about, the study with morally myopic and morally mute advertising uh, practitioners, well, we also had some morally sensitive advertising people in that, um, in that group. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about them. They recognized the ethical issues. They talked about them. In fact, their agencies were uh, characterized by all kinds of communication. These people felt like it was their job to say no to their clients. They weren't the pleaseaholics that I described who were morally myopic and morally mute. Um, these people felt that a trusted business advisor needed to say no to a client, to protect the client, to look after the client's best interest. And they, in these agencies, I should have told you, we, we found these people clustered together typically in agencies together, and the agencies had articulated their values and virtues, and these virtues had been broadly embraced, and they were things that had to do with ethics, like integrity and fairness and uh, justice, those sorts of things. And perhaps most importantly, these people had what we call moral imagination. That is, they could think outside the box and see alternatives other people uh, couldn't see. And of course, this is what we're trying to do in all types of business, right? Whether it's creative strategy, um, strategic decisions about where your business needs to go in the future, we're trying to have people use imagination. So a lot of these skills are the same skills that you use in all kinds of business and professional activities. And then these people really had a community. They had people who supported each other in living these virtuous lives. And I think that uh, we know from philosophers way back to Aristotle that, that um, you know, people do better when they're living in a community, sur community surrounded by virtue, uh, whether you have that community that you uh, embrace in your workplace or build around you through your friends and family outside of work. And uh, some people say that Aristotle was the first behavioral ethicist, ethicist because of his uh, focus on practice and rehearsal. Um, so moral imagination is a big thing, and that raises the question, how can we increase people's capacity for moral imagination? And I want to talk about um, giving voice to values, which is both a, a book and also a curriculum by Dr. Mary Gentile, who's now at UVA and has just left the Babson College uh, Business School. And her basic idea is that we need to... Uh, assuming people have good values, we need to um, increase their capacity to act on those values. Giving voice to values is a metaphor for living out your values. And so she says, let's create a thought experiment. Let's say, if I were to do something, what could I do? And her emphasis is on using, again, the same business skills that you use in all kinds of business to be a great communicator and to uh, be a good 
um, organizational politician and, um, and to really try to do things that will increase the probability that you will be able to act on your values and that you'll influence others as well. And so again, the emphasis is on practice to, and, and so the emphasis is on giving students many opportunities to think about short cases that present the types of ethical dilemmas that they'll have in their professional lives and to practice how they would respond to them, to build scripts so that when they get into the workplace, they're much more likely to know how to act, to recognize the issues, to know how to act and know how to deal with them and know what arguments to make. So I've left a couple of um, websites with um, links to Mary's curriculum, which also is offered free and used throughout the world. And uh, in, in terms of giving students practice, what I typically do, and this is following uh, Mary's template, is to ask students to look at different ethical dilemmas that they could face, or dilemmas or temptations, and ask them to think about what reasons and rationalizations should raise red flags, which are the behavioral ethics rationalizations, like uh, the boss made me do it, or the client is always right, or everybody else is doing it. Get them to identify those get them to think about all the stakeholders. Because when you start thinking about stakeholders, you got start thinking about their interests and the consequences for them. And then you think about the levers. What kind of levers can you use to increase the strength that you'll have, to increase the influence you'll have? And then thinking about your most powerful and persuasive arguments, when you'll say them, to whom you'll say them, those sorts of things. And uh, again, practice and rehearsal. Mary talks about a lot of levers, and, and we certainly want to make students attuned to the levers they can use. I won't elaborate on these, but certainly we want to frame things in the long run rather than the short term, because the long run tends to favor ethics and the benefits of ethical behavior, whereas the short term oftentimes uh, favors unethical behavior. We want to think about the organization's wider purpose and how we can, and, and you know, that wider purpose typically is about something more than just making money. So how can we frame things in terms of the wider purpose? We want to watch out for false dichotomies like um, thinking that we have to either be ethical and go broke or um, be unethical and make a lot of money. We need to think of alternatives to be both ethical and successful. We need to position ourselves as agents of constant change, continual change, rather than people who are slapping others on the, uh, on, the, on the wrist. We need to find actionable alternatives, solutions, other things that people can do. We need to find allies. We need to point out the cost to various parties because oftentimes unethical behavior has costs and it can be hidden. Oftentimes there are addictive cycles to ethical behavior. You cheat on your uh, numbers this quarter to make your bonus and you have to do it again next quarter, those sorts of things. And we certainly want to use our most persuasive arguments. So these are the kinds of things that we can do to, um, to make good decisions and then live them out in our daily lives. But there's one other question I want to address before I move to the mechanisms that we can use to teach these sorts of things in business and professional schools. And uh, this question is, how and why do people influence their organizations to act ethically? And now I'm going to talk about some research that Marlene Neal and I did together. And in fact, she's the first author on the article I'll be drawing from. But um, I don't know if you've heard the term organizational conscience. If you're in PR, you probably have. Because PR practitioners and also professors think that PR people are in a great position to play the role of organizational conscience. Well, what is an organizational conscience? It's a professional who raises concerns when his organization's actions might bring about troubling consequences to various people inside or outside the organization. And this person is concerned not only with issues of the law, but also with issues that extend beyond the law and encompass the spirit of the law and issues that the law does not address. So these are people who want to help their organizations be ethical organizations. And um, PR people, you can probably see, are in a great position to play this role because they are the boundary spanners. They span the boundary between the organization and various stakeholders. So they're aware of the stakeholders' perceptions of the organization 
And, uh, and so uh, there's been research that people, PR people should play this role and could play this role, but also research that shows they often don't. And so we wanted to go in and interview people who thought that PR people should play this role and who had played it. And so we had some surprising findings. I just want to highlight a couple of findings from that study. Uh, one involves the role conception. These people conceived of their roles as having dual loyalties. Sure, they had loyalties to the organization, but they also had loyalties to the public interest. And their loyalties to the public interest were at least as strong as their loyalties to the organization. They felt that their job was to be an independent voice. They felt that their value came from being an independent voice. They said things like, the yes man has no value. We've got to play an independent role here. Their personal credibility was on the line because they were the senior PR people in major companies and nonprofits and, and public agencies. And of course, they were the face of the organization. And they saw their work as problem solving, not communication, but problem solving. And they saw, thought that ethics was a key part of their jobs, even though ethics was not in any of their job descriptions. So these were the people who played this role. And uh, a couple of surprising things about what they did. Uh, one thing, they had to give unwelcomed information to superiors, tell superiors about problems, about behaviors they thought were unethical and problematic. And so I expected these people, since they were graduates of places like the Baylor uh, Communications, Journalism, PR program, I thought they would be ardent debaters, that they would be great um, preachers and evangelists, but they were not that. They did not do that. They instead were great at, at uh, giving experiential kind of approaches or using experiential approaches to communication like a mock interview. Someone would suggest an unethical approach and so they'd say let's, let's play this out. Let's just see what happens. And of course a mock interview would demonstrate to the executive how this approach would blow up in her face. Or the headline test. You know, could we live with a headline in the New York Times or the Waco Tribune? Writing a speech two ways, the unethical way and the ethical way so the person could see the difference. And then playing the devil's advocate, where you're um, you know, kind of uh, doing something in a more objective, less emotional way, saying, well, it, let's imagine what somebody could say to poke holes in this. These people were great at this kind of communication. And uh, they also provided ethical alternatives. People will hear you so much better if you provide alternatives. I want to just make uh, one other point about these folks, and this is that access was a problem for them. Uh, they often were not called to the decision-making table before a crisis, before a problem. They were being called in afterwards. And so what they had to do was understand the informal power coalition, the people who influence decisions, uh, who may or may not be at the uh, table with the CEO. And so they had to, to be um, friends with these folks, they had to earn their trust and confidence, and they had to influence them. And they did this by building relationships with key leaders and by demonstrating their basic business literacy and their skill in the core business ideas and by educating themselves about this. And so you can see how they were great organizational politicians, in the best sense of the word, politician. Um, and so I think that's what we have to be. We have to be great communicators. Well, first we have to have keen moral vision. We have to understand our loyalty to the, to the public interest as well as to the organization and be great communicators and resourceful communicators and then also really fine uh, organizational politicians. Now I'd like to, to turn and talk about why leadership as a context for teaching ethics. There are many substantive reasons for teaching ethics in, under the umbrella of, uh, of leadership, but uh, beyond that, everybody wants to be a leader. leader it, leadership is viewed as, as such a virtue, and, uh, and so I think that when we frame ethics in terms of being ethical leaders, it makes it very attractive and it makes it seem like something that's gonna empower uh, a student rather than ethics as feeling like a constraint, something that keeps you from uh, doing what you'd like to do. 
And then, of course, when you think about all the key leadership competencies, like uh, communicating supportively to people, leading positive change, building power and influence, uh, dealing with conflict, ethics has to be integrated into all of those key competencies in order for a leader uh, to be an effective ethical leader. So I think that is um, the rationale. But I must be candid with you and say that uh, we've had resistance at teaching ethics at UT. We've also had resistance to teaching leadership for all kinds of reasons. Some people say leadership's not really a discipline, it's all common sense. Other academics say we're the only ones who ought to be able to teach it, nobody else should teach it. Others say it's interdisciplinary, we don't do that, that's somebody else. So it's, it's really been uh, a struggle at the University of Texas. But I'd like to talk now about some of the things that, that we've done at UT, and believe me, if we can do it, anybody can do it. We have so many constraints because of our size and our bureaucracy. As one example, um, earlier at UT, if I wanted to go to a conference in another country or give a talk in another country, my um, trip had to be approved by my department chair, the dean, the provost, the president, and the governor. So we, we live with lots of uh, constraints that some of you may not have. So I want to talk to you about Leadership and Ethics Flag Courses, which is an initiative that started uh, just a few years ago. Leadership and Ethics Flag Courses are courses where one-third of the graded content focuses on practical ethics. And um, it's re as of the 2016-2018 catalog, our next catalog, it is required of all majors. And it has been something that we've had to work at doggedly to get the courses. Uh, the idea is every student will take a practical ethics course in his or her major before graduating. And um, as of the 2015-2016 academic year, last year, we had more than 21,000 ethics and leadership seats taken. And so this is something that um, I think is, is, is a really uh, wonderful initiative, and I think it's done more than anything else to change the culture of the campus, but it has taken uh, a lot of work. And uh, in the past five years, we've had almost 80,000 ethics and leadership seats taken. Uh, another set of courses, the Bridging Disciplines Programs in ethics and leadership. Uh, we started these in 2002. I've been either chair or co-chair of the faculty panel. It's an interdisciplinary set of courses, a 19-hour certificate program. It's open to students from any major, and they, the um, concentration, the certificate, includes six to nine hours of what's called connecting experiences, which are either internships or research appointments with faculty that connect your Bridging Disciplines program with your major. So here are the Bridging Disciplines programs we have. Business, healthcare, law, politics, and government, media. So you could be a business student taking the Ethics and Leadership in Healthcare Bridging Disciplines program, and you would do internships and faculty research, and research appointments with faculty to connect healthcare and business. Um, so, so I think this is a, a, a wonderful set of programs. We also have a number of co-curricular programs. Um, Texas Leadership Summit, one day program through our Office of Student Deans, open to anybody, any student who'd like to do it. Uh, I don't know if you all have heard of the Hatton Sumner's Student Leadership Conference. It's a three-day conference. It happens in February. It brings together student leaders from all over the United States. If you're a student leader from another university, I hope you'll apply. Just Google Hatton Sumner Student Leadership Conference. The application's open, I think, around December 1st. It's a great program. It's run by Howard Prince, who's got a chair in ethical leadership at the LBJ School of Public Policy. We've got a Change Institute, which is three days. We've got uh, Leadership Education and Progress, which is an eight-week program that has instruction in leadership. We've got Project LEAD, which is two semesters. The first semester is instruction in various kinds of leadership uh, competencies. The second semester is 
uh, consulting where you do volunteer consulting for nonprofits using your leadership skills. So a lot can be done through co-curricular programs that expand the offerings to people who might have very crowded majors and just can't take a certificate program. Um, so I'd like to conclude my comments by saying who's the foe here? And um, I want to draw on what uh, Ellie Wiesel, the Holocaust survivor, and B business uh, BU, uh, the other BU, Boston University professor said. He said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And I really think that the opposite of good ethics is not so much bad ethics, but indifference. And we know as educators that we can help people keep from being indifferent. And that's, that's certainly one thing we can do in uh, ethics and leadership courses in business and professional schools. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Mar Marlene's going to lead the discussion. Thank you for coming forward with a question. Okay. So, what do you do when you're dealing in situations where other people have significantly different roles or ethical standards? Either whether it's a different culture or just the So, the question is, is this is this is a hard question. What do you do when people have different ethical values than you do? Uh, particularly if they're people in another culture. So that is, that is a really tough question. I think that um, this is the type question where it's really easy to uh, lapse into some uh, rationalizations. Everybody does it. You know, I've got to do this to succeed. So I think that first you'd want to be uh, really sure that you're thinking carefully about rationalizations that could prevent you from, um, from living out your values. I think a stakeholder analysis, looking at the stakeholders, seeing if there really is damage that you're doing to other parties. Um, I, th I think John Rawls' veil of ignorance, where you assume you don't know which party you are, and you say what's just, you try to analyze what's just to all the stakeholders. That kind of analysis can be really helpful. Um, so those are the kinds of analysis analyses that might be helpful. Um, I certainly have heard business people like Marvin Gerard at um, Pier 1 who talk about how, uh, you know, he has refused to pay bribes in other countries where it's customary and that, um, you know, he's able to do business. So I think, I think it's sometimes possible to come up with solutions when you uh, are willing to take a stand and try to use moral imagination, uh, try to think, you know, what could I do if I wanted to do something? Uh, but I, I do think that you put your thumb on what is, is one of the really tough issues. He is um, working on a degree in finance, and he's interested in uh, how incentives play into um, decisions about ethics, particularly long-term versus short-term. And you're exactly right. It's really easy for, for incentives that might seem kind of neutral on their face to really have negative impact on the way people make ethical decisions. And, and there are many cases where unreasonable expectations or uh, poorly aligned incentives 
make it so people feel like they have no choice but to do unethical things. And uh, I think that, that no matter what your major is, you need to be an astute student of organizations to try to understand these kinds of incentives that may not be immediately um, apparent and to try to be really smart in how you try to align people's incentives for the long term versus the short term, thinking about uh, the company reputation, thinking about um, you know all those factors that in the short term uh, you know might might be kind of abstract. So so I think that's a, that's a real challenge, and I think it's it's uh, wonderful for, to, for students to take as much as they can in uh, disciplines related to organizational studies. So they understand human behavior in organizations. And that same sort of um, theory informs behavioral finance, where people look at how financial consultants and others make bad decisions uh, based on certain biases and uh, decisions that are too risky. And so you know, I think this really can blend beautifully with the substance of a, a business or uh, communication or other kind of professional degree at the undergraduate or the graduate level. But that's also a, a, a great question and one of the key tensions in business. Yes. Absolutely, that's an excellent point. The um, behavioral ethics draws very heavily on sociology on, um, and, and uh, on identifying things like groupthink and all kinds of um, social and organizational pressures. The conformity bias is a big one that we talk about. And so, you know, I think that uh, studying psychology and sociology is wonderful in terms of of uh, giving one an understanding of these kinds of things. And certainly, most of the work in organizations is done in groups, so we've got to understand all kinds of phenomena. And these same phenomena, like, uh, you know, maybe it's one person who comes out early advocating something and has undue influence on the group. We have to understand these phenomena for all aspects of an or organizational life, not just ethics, all aspects. So, one of the uh, things I try to help students see is that by being better at behavioral ethics, you're going to be better at your job generally because of these things that you're referring to that you understand that just uh, filter through all, all aspects of organizational life and that can lead to bad strategic decisions and bad um, financial decisions and, and, and that sort of thing. So thank you for that question. Jack Abramoff? He was a Jew, yes. Mm -hmm. he like right. Uh, and him talking about how, like, how people were like following the law, and, but like, there were still so many like, who were in line with that. And uh, so that, the point I guess there was that if you just follow the law, that's not enough ethically. Uh, so where then do we find like, the. Because for me, faith, I think that. So the question is uh, how to bridge the gap between uh, religious people who are guided by faith, who uh, have a commitment to doing the right thing, versus other folks, and, um, and particularly when it comes to things that um, are kind of uh, legal but not ethical. 
and you referred to Jack Abramoff, I want to make the point that, that he was way over the line with the law as well as unethical, and he just wasn't seeing any of it. But um, certainly I think having a Christian commitment is a great starting place for ethics in business and the professions, and I think Christian communities can be great places for people to uh, support each other, explore these issues, and uh, talk about these issues. Um, I think our challenge in um, state universities and non-church institutions is, is um, providing compelling reasons for people who might not be coming to this perspective from a faith-based approach for being in this place with the same commitment. And I think that uh, commitment can come from uh, understanding the long-term benefits reputationally for the firm, for themselves. Um, and, and, I, and I have found that, that um, there are many people at a place like the University of Texas who, are, who do have a vibrant religious faith and who do find ethics uh, very much in sync with their lives, but there also are people who don't have a vibrant faith who come to feel very committed to living an ethical life. Um, I think part of our challenge is changing the business culture overall. And um, we all know Christians who have a lot of blind spots about, um, and a lot of compartmentalization, ways they'll act at, our, at their church or with their families and friends, and then they'll act differently in business. So I think it's a, a challenge for all of us. And um, that in a sense, uh, we're, we're thinking about changing the business culture and and, but, but I do think there are compelling arguments for uh, living a professional life that is uh, in sync with the premises of uh, behavioral ethics, even if you're coming from it not from a perspective of faith. I've seen that happen. I'm, I'm sure you all probably know some people who are really good people and are really want to be good people, but, uh, but don't have the type of faith that, uh, that we'd like for them to share with us. Yes. Does anybody else have a, a has any, anybody else have something to share while he's coming up on this topic of um, of how to deal with others that may not share your commitment to to faith? Yes. Right. Yeah. The Better Business Bureau has has uh, is a a group that. Um, a group of members that's speaking out on some of these topics and taking a stand and trying to, uh, through self-regulatory means, trying to have an impact. And um, we, we, we certainly want to think about uh, self-regulation as well. And we've seen through the Better Business Bureau their, um, their initiative on uh, food and beverage advertising to children has, has been an uh, initiative over seven or eight years now that's made some progress. So. Uh, you know, I think all these mechanisms need to be um, considered and, and used. Well, you all have been a wonderful audience. It's been such a, such a pleasure to be here with you, and I'm so impressed with your questions. Those were very thoughtful and uh, uh, productive questions. Thank you.